what, we, what we're lucky to have with us right now is two experts on the organ that we have in the chapel. We have Nicholas Thistlethwaite, who is known, I suspect, to many of you for his expertise on the English English organ, and he's worked also, he's done work on, our, on the original organs that we had before we ever had the Schnetzler. And then Martin Renshaw, who has done a lot of work on Schnetzler, and will be able to speak about what's interesting about our organ in the context of what we have left of Schnetzlers elsewhere in the country. Simon Jackson is our new, brand new, one week old director of music. <laughs> and has been helping with the working, bringing around the thinking about what kind of an organ we might, what we might do with the organ in the future, though that's not actually the reason for the discussion today. Thank you. Nicholas? Thank you. I had the privilege of speaking to the conference in 2010 um, around the Peterhouse Park books and the paper I gave then was a rather longer treatment of the story, as far as we can reconstruct it, of the organ which was installed in the Wren Cousin Chapel in the 1630s. What I'm offering today is essentially a distillation of that rather longer paper, but as many of you will know, the proceedings of the 2010 conference are shortly, shortly, I believe, to be published and so the longer paper will become available. The organs really raise fascinating questions, and although I'm talking about the organ of the 1630s, it just, if I can just go off at a tangent slightly for a moment, um, what I'm going to try and do is give you some context for the 1630s and a narrative about what we know about the organ and its fate. But in a way, we need to do the same for the Snetzler organ in the mid-18th century, not least because Peterhouse is interesting, um, perhaps not for the first time in going against the trend, um, because in the mid-18th century a number of colleges were discontinuing the use of an organ, uh, even disposing of an instrument if they had one, and I'm fascinated to know why it was that Peterhouse acquired an organ in the 1760s and exactly how they used it. Um, now, it's a question at the moment. I don't know the answer. I haven't had a look at the college archives to try and find the answer, though having briefly looked through the records for that period, I'm not sure there is much evidence, but I leave it hanging in the air as a question to be resolved, if possible, at some point, not least in the context of deciding where the college will go from this point with the remains of that organ of 1765 important as they are. But anyway, back to the pre-Civil War organ in Peterhouse Chapel. The installation of an organ in the chapel was of more than musical significance. Under the influence of Calvinist heads of house like Roger Goad, provost of kings between 1570 and 1610, organs had been removed from the college chapels. It's likely that in most colleges, the musical component of the services was reduced to the congregational singing of unaccompanied metrical psalms. A reaction began in 1593, when Trinity College, no doubt under the influence of its anti-Calvinist master, Thomas Neville, commissioned a new organ. And this was reinforced in 1605, when Kings, with the connivance of Robert Cecil, Chancellor of the University, as well as Principal Minister of the Crown, spent the enormous sum for those days of £371 on an ambitious new instrument. The installation of these two organs signalled growing confidence among the anti-Calvinists, or avant-garde conformists, as they're sometimes called. But for the moment, this was where matters rested in Cambridge. It was only after the translation of William Lord to the Archbishopric of Canterbury in 1633 and the promotion of several of his closest allies to Cambridge headships around the same time that the Arminian party felt sufficiently confident to attempt a radical reordering of Anglican worship. This is the context in which five colleges, 
Jesus, St John's, Pembroke, Queen's and Peterhouse commissioned organs between 1634 and 1639. Although organs could be and were used to accompany the singing of metrical psalms, the objective of the reformers was to provide an accompaniment for the type of choral service associated with the Chapel Royal and the English cathedrals. It's therefore no surprise to find that shortly after his installation as master of Peterhouse in 1635, John Cousin took steps to create a choral body to sing services in the chapel, and Scott said something about this yesterday. A statute promulgated on the 29th of August provided for choral services on Sundays and saints' days and their eves. On the 12th of November, a further statute provided for the appointment of an organist, whose duties included instructing the poor scholars who were to form the nucleus of the chapel choir. An unnamed organist, but probably it was Thomas Wilson, received his first quarterly payment for commons on the 14th of December that year. The November 1635 statute required the organist, and I quote, to play the organs which they recently added to the chapel at the divine offices. Earlier in the year, we find that four pounds, four shillings and a penny had been expended on two journeys to Doddington in the Isle of Ely, again I quote, in respect of the organ sought, or perhaps to be fetched from there, which is the gift of Lady Peyton. Alice Peyton's son, Algernon, had been admitted to Peterhouse in 1632, and the table of benefactors recorded that Sir John Peyton and Alice, his wife, again I quote, solicited by the master, contributed a pneumatic organ worth £40. Now this suggests a small consort or chamber organ, very like the one we heard in chapel last night, given for use in the chapel until a new instrument could be commissioned. A payment of £8 to William Ashley, the joiner about whom we've heard much in the last 24 hours, in November 1635, for divers works about ye organ loft, ye back of ye altar, etc., confirms that the organ stood in a gallery, although it offers no clues as to its whereabouts or whether it had been built specially to accommodate the new instrument. Shortly before this, a fugitive leaf from the chapel accounts, now in the British Library, records a payment on the 15th of October of one shilling and sixpence to Ashley's man for setting up the organ case. Then, on the 25th of December, there was a payment for a candlestick for the organist, implying that the Peyton organ was in use by Christmas 1635 and that in the depths of winter its player required additional illumination. Cousin must have been grateful to Alice Peyton for her gift, but it seems likely that it was understood by them both to be a temporary expedient. His plans for the beautification of the chapel and the creation of a musical foundation probably also included the commissioning of a new instrument as soon as funds became available. By the 1630s, an organ was recognised as a necessary accessory to the choral service with its growing repertoire of verse settings and anthems, examples of which are preserved in the Caroline Park books at Peterhouse, and the success of Cousin's plans for his new foundation depended upon acquiring a suitable instrument for the chapel. He therefore set about securing the necessary funding from the college and its members. The computer's role for 1638-9 includes a separate account headed Computus Novi Organi, immediately after the ordinary chapel account. It records in some detail income and expenditure, amounting respectively to £146, 18 shillings and eightpence, that's the income, and £145, 13 shillings and one penny, that's the expenditure, and that would have kept Mr Micawber happy, I think. The master himself gave £10. The Bishop of Ely, either Francis White or Matthew Wren, who succeeded him in 1638, gave £10, 10 shillings and sixpence. 
Various fellows and masters of arts were also donors, and the sum of £33 was diverted from the dividend due to fellows of the first foundation. Were these gifts spontaneous, we might wonder, or did some members of the foundation sense which way the wind was blowing? The expenditure recorded in the roll tells us something about the construction and materials of the new organ. From it, we learn that an organ maker, unnamed, took 34 weeks to construct the organ. He was paid 30 shillings each week for his labour, so 50 pound, 51 pounds in all, and his servant received eight pounds 10 shillings, presumably over the same period. The college seems to have paid directly for materials. 400 pounds of tin, interestingly there's no mention of lead, although organ pipes are normally made with more lead than tin. Various timbers, for the frame, the soundboards, action components, some pipes, keyboards, stops and the wooden parts of the wind system. Parchment, for sealing wind trunks, bellows and soundboards. Leather, for bellows charcoal for casting metal, and various pieces of ironwork. The catch-all reference to other necessaries would include other essential items, such as nails, wire, glue and cloth. So labour cost £59.10, shillings, materials £45.08, shillings and threepence, a total of £104.18, shillings and threepence. A separate account records expenditure on the organ case. This was the work of a different tradesman, a joiner who received £16, again for 32 weeks' work, and his servants, who received £3.08 and sixpence. Materials are again recorded separately, and so were probably purchased directly by the college. £8, 13 and fourpence for various woods, £4.08 shillings for tools, glue, charcoal and other necessaries. It's interesting to find payments, £8.05 shillings, to two carvers. Thomas Ventris may have been or have been related to a carver of that name from York. But George Woodruff was certainly a Cambridge craftsman who worked for a number of colleges including King's, Keys and Clare. In all, the case cost £40 14 shillings and 10 pence, 27 pounds 13 and 6 for labour, 13 pounds 1 shilling and 4 pence for materials. There's evidence that it was intended to have the case embellished with gilding and colour, which was the usual practice for high status organ cases at that period. One or two examples survive. But it looks as though the money ran out. There's no record of payment for that here at Peterhouse. Although the surviving account in the computer's roll tells us a good deal, frustratingly, it doesn't name the organ maker. A strong candidate must be Robert Dallam, whose father, Thomas, had built the King's organ in 1605-6, and who himself built organs for Jesus College, 1634-5, at a cost of £200, and St John's College, 1635-6, at a cost of £185. The Dallams were the most prominent English organ makers of their day, building instruments for cathedrals, colleges and the royal chapels. Another possibility, suggested to me by Professor Nicholas Tyack at the conference in 2010, is a man called Emmanuel Cresswell. Little is known about him, but he was commissioned to make a new organ for St George's Chapel, Windsor in 1635 on the orders of Matthew Wren, Dean of Windsor and cousin's predecessor at Peterhouse. So Cresswell is a possibility, but I think Robert Dallam remains the favourite. The other omission from the record is any information about the tonal design of the instrument. Dallam's organ for St John's cost approximately £40 more than Peterhouse's instrument, and we know from the contract which survives that John's had six stops. So the Peterhouse organ perhaps had five, and no pedals, because English organs didn't have pedals at that time. 
Finally, we must consider the position of the organ in the chapel. And this is very pertinent to uh, what we've been hearing over the last 24 hours about the original arrangement of the interior. It's already been mentioned that William Ashley, the carpenter, was paid eight pounds for work in the chapel, including works about the organ loft in November 1635. This must surely have been over the antechapel, or was perhaps a shallow loft on top of the screen. According to David Scott, from whom we heard yesterday, there was a gallery in the southwest corner of the antechapel supporting a royal closet. Access to an organ loft in the northwest corner or on top of the screen would therefore presumably have been by way of the surviving staircase on the north side of the antechapel. The accounts reveal that further work was necessary when the new organ arrived in 1638-9. Three pounds, 18 shillings was paid, I quote, for adapting, possibly inserting, the little organ and for other work done in the chapel by joiners and carpenters. But this is ambiguous. Was it perhaps a reference to removing the Peyton organ, the little organ, to a new location in the college. We do know that the Peyton organ remained here. Uh, I think it went to the parlour and uh, tradition has it that it was used to accompany musical activity there. Also of possible relevance is an entry in Cousins' lift list of monies expended on the chapel, recording £60 for, I quote, the sacristy, small box and little organ. Could this be about arrangements in the antechapel? Was there perhaps a small sacristy with a chest for vestments or plate? And did it relate structurally in some way to the organ loft above it? There is at the moment no simple answer to these questions, though a physical survey of the existing screen and gallery might provide some information. But the likelihood is that both the Peyton organ and its successor stood in a loft at the west end of the chapel. Neither would have required a great deal of floor space. The larger organ would have been no more than three feet deep, although the bellows and the organist's stool would also have to have been accommodated. To complete the story, at least in outline, and again there's more information in the paper to be published shortly. With the outbreak of civil war, the Cambridge Colleges that had distinguished themselves as models of Laudian practice were increasingly vulnerable as Parliament's grip on East Anglia tightened. Chapel furnishings were removed and organs wholly or partially dismantled. At Peterhouse, one Anthony Faulkner and his labourers were paid in April 1643 for removing the organ pipes. Consequently, when William Dowsing, the iconoclast, visited the college at the end of the year, his catalogue of destruction makes no mention of an organ. Some years later, Cousin's Puritan successor, Lazarus Seaman, got wind that the chapel furnishings had been concealed in the college library and ordered a search. As Scott told us this morning, it seems that Seaman knew about this all the time. Among the hall, I quote, the organ pipes of wooden metal were discovered. In 1653, the pipes and the old case, which had evidently also survived, were sold to Mr. Gregory Hardwick, citizen of London, for £31. At the restoration, after 1660, the college attempted to retrieve them, but by then Hardwick had paid the Cambridge organ builder Lancelot Peace to install and complete the organ in his house. Despite taking legal advice, the college was unable to reclaim their organ, though it may have occasioned some satisfaction in the combination room in 1666, when the Great Fire almost certainly deprived Hardwick of his prize. Defeated, the college commissioned a new organ from Thomas Tamer, another Cambridge builder, some of whose work survives at Framlingham in Suffolk in an organ that he built for Pembroke College. And the organ he built here was completed in the early part of 1667. The college archives have little to tell about its subsequent history, 
but an organist was paid the not inconsiderable sum of £26.13 and fourpence out of the Hale benefaction until at least 1734. Indeed, the Tamer organ probably survived until it was superseded by the Snetzler organ, given in 1765 by Horatio Mann, a fellow commoner of Peterhouse. But that's another story which I think Martin is now going to talk about. Thank you. I just wanted to make two comments, actually, if I may, about Nicholas's talk, which is fascinating. One is that there seemed to be hyperinflation in the period between the 1530s and the 1630s, well caught. <laughs> and uh, 40 pounds for an organ would have bought one of the largest pre-Reformation organs that we know about, or almost, because we only have prices, or rather we have prices for only two organs, in the 1520s, one at Coventry, which is in the 20s, £23 or something like that, as I remember, and then another one at All Hallows Barking by the Tower, which is in the early 50s uh, in terms of pounds, and that was a very big organ for the period. In fact, the second organ on the site, because there was a royal chapel uh, alongside the church there, and Anthony Duddington, who built the organ for All Hallows, almost certainly built the previous organ, and had a tuning contract which obliged him to tune both organs about every month, which proves pretty well conclusively to me that it was a large and certainly it had reeds and other trumpet style pipes in it that needed constant attention, constant tuning to fit in with the other pipes. So a 40 pounds organ a century later, which was a small organ, must imply inflation of around two or three times. And I think that is probably about right. I'm not an expert on overall inflation, but I have studied the amount of labour that money will, will buy, which in a sense is actually real inflation. It's purchasing power. And uh, that probably chimes in quite well with that. My other reflection is about the organs, because it sounds like two organs, it possibly even three with an organ in the hall or the parlour, that were built in the 1630s. These were all built in sort of bits and pieces. People would come up from London, say, if it was the Dallam family, and they would stay in Cambridge working on the spot, casting their metal possibly on the spot. It looks like it, because the tin was bought, brought in, apparently, to Cambridge, and generally uh, dumping themselves on the college for the, for the time being. And then other people would be brought in for making the case, and if the college had been able to afford it, yet other people for the colouration and embellishment of the case as well. So the tale I'm going to tell you now is actually a real step advance, if you like, on that's these sort of techniques. Because first of all, if you're building organs in bits and pieces, you don't know necessarily from the beginning how much it's going to cost. You can have a contract with the organ builder, perhaps you will have a contract with the case maker though that sounds a little more doubtful because the case maker is presumably going to wrap his case round the existing organ and the case maker will not know how big that organ is until it's made. Now, of course, people talk to each other and so on, but this is not, nothing very defined in advance, if you like. Whereas with the organs of Snetzler, it's perfectly clear that Snetzler was able, because of his background, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, and because of his workshop practices, which we'll come to as well, he could, in advance, say to Horatio Mann, your gift will cost X or X pounds. Actually, do we know how much it cost? No, no I don't think we do. <laughs> That's the trouble with gifts. There's nothing written down, really. It's a big problem for us researchers, isn't it? Very often, something suddenly, suddenly appears and we have nothing in the archives. It was given. Anyway, let's go back to Snetzler. He was, I think it could be argued, the most important organ builder of the 18th century, though of course he was not English, not British. He was referred to as, by his contemporaries as German, but that's only in the general sense that everybody uses for anything from Holland downwards to uh, somewhere in Switzerland, for anybody who's actually born 
to and speaks currently German. We, don't, we do know when Snetzer was born. In 1710, he was born as one of the seven children of a miller on the falls at Schaffhausen. We don't know exactly when he came to Britain, though it's perfectly possible that he came as part of what Defoe, I think, describes as the poor immigrant Lutheran Protestant uh, workman who came over by invitation, one might add, in the 1710s and 20s. But I've been completely unable, despite searching and searching, to of finding the immigrant re records that actually include Snetzler or any other members of his family, because it is possible that at least one other member of his family came over as well. But anyway, be that as it may, he was certainly in England by the age of around 20, in other words, about 1730. He, in a sense, started off as Robert Dallum might have done uh, nearly 100 years before, building organs on the spot. We have correspondence, for instance, of him building an organ on the spot at the Full Neck Mor Moravian Chapel near Leeds. Very extensive uh, correspondence. I say entirely on the spot, but not quite. We're not sure where he built some of it, but certainly some of it was built actually on the spot. And it seems it's quite possible that even some of the Moravians themselves, who were dab hands at uh, woodwork, certainly, rather like the Amish later on, probably built some of the case at least and possibly even carved it, uh, the ornament on it, the sum of which actually still remains. But anyway, it's a slow process uh, setting yourself up as an organ builder in England, as I only know too well. And it took at least another 20 years, that is, until the 1750s, for Snetzer to become fully recognised. In the meanwhile, he built quite a number of relatively small organs, though, in fact, in various parts of the kingdom, as Bernie put it in another context later on. He certainly built organs in the, in the north of England and around Hull, and it seems quite possibly in the London suburbs as well. Quite how he got known there is, isn't totally clear, but if he was by that stage based in London, as seems pretty likely, that would explain why his most important and iconic organ the, in this first phase was ordered by Charles Burney, who had been sent by his doctor to recuperate from the London air at, in the more pleasant and uh, wholesome air of King's Lynn, Bernie could order, or ask in the first place, in fact, Snetzler to come and assess the previous organ, which Snetzler said wasn't worth touching, basically, and then order an instrument from Snetzler in 1754 to 5 that proved to be so successful that Snetzler's reputation was absolutely established. And at that stage, Snetzler must have had a complete workshop set up in London and pretty certainly where it stayed for the rest of his life, that is in Soho, with a warehouse, as he called it, in Dean Street, which is almost certainly a large building in which he could put up the organs complete. And in fact, later on, it's, we know from documents that important organists came along and demonstrated these organs before they went off, well, to Ireland, to the United States, and certainly to other parts of England. And then in the course, then, of the next... 30 odd years, thank you, Snetzler built enough organs to fill a book. <laughs> and uh, because I was working on a Snetzler organ in 1980 BC something, 85 I think it was, I decided I'd find out, I'd find out as much as I could about organs. And it so came that uh, there was an opportunity to edit some work that someone else had done in terms of documentary evidence of Snetzler's organs for uh, a PhD and I was able to find a publisher as well, that this joint enterprise book came out in 1994, which will be succeeded, we hope, within the next two years by a second edition uh, with another person, a very good researcher, in, especially into the, docu paper docu uh, the newspaper documentation of Snetzer's organs. Anyway, by the time he first retired to, to Switzerland in 1781, uh, Snetzer had built something like, we think, 105 organs, or rebuilt substantially. That is an amazing production. And it must have meant that his workshop was extremely well organised. These are all but a handful new instruments, uh, all but a handful with new cases as well. 
Just there were one or two, like at St George's Hanover Square, where he put an organ into a pre-existing case of an organ, in fact, that wasn't actually all that old, but clearly not successful enough for the likes of John Keeble, the organist of Handel, because it's Handel's parish church. And we, it's, we, it's interesting, this morning we were talking about woodwork in the chapel, and I was asking myself the question, now did Snetzler build the case? If he did, why, uh, well, he would have naturally built it in oak, a large organ, that was a fairly typical timber for, for church organs at the time. But did he specifically do it in oak to match other timbers? If he did it in oak, is there any sign in the present case, as well as the rest of the woodwork, uh, of what the original uh, shade, uh, lack of colouring perhaps in the case of the organ, because the organ case is distinctly lighter than a lot of the wood, woodwork, once you look at it closely. Was the organ case natural Baltic oak, which it mostly is in fact. Was it uh, lacquered, which it would have been fairly certainly. Was it tinted at all? Sometimes you get a hint of a dragon's blood, that is a red tint, to liven up the grain of the oak. There are quite a lot of questions one could ask about Snetzer's cases, not the least of which is something I'm afraid I've discovered since the first book, that Snetzler did not, for his chamber organs, use mahogany always as we've sort of assumed, because later organ cases were made of mahogany. Uh, a, a timber, as you know, was brought in well, in, first, uh, in great quantities of the first time for building cannons in the 1710s. Uh, but in fact, Snetzler built at least a number of his smaller organs in pear and stained it red. So it actually looks like mahogany until you look at it jolly closely. And I had the occasion to, to look at a a 1760 case, because it's an organ that's actually in my workshop at the moment, of his, and another one of the 70, later 1760s at Wesley's Chapel now in Bristol, only the other day, and it's quite clear that these cases are not made of mahogany at all, they're made of pear. So we should not jump to conclusions, but not with the smaller organs, but with a bigger organ, perhaps we can take some conclusions as to the finish of the woodwork in general from the case which doesn't seem to mean to be too interfered with. It's been allowed to sit up there and darken slightly with, with age, as one would naturally expect. Let's just go back a little bit to the organisation of his workshop. As I say, it was very different from the arrangement that Dallam and his contemporaries, and then uh, the later, uh, early 18th century, English organ builders did. But Snetzer was the first person to really organise a central workshop to build, if I'm right, the cases as well as the organs. Previous organ builders, for instance, the organ builders Smith and Harris, who was a, a member of, by marriage anyway, of the Dallam family. His original name was René Harrison, in fact. He was born in probably Brelevene, which is part of Lannion in, in Brittany. They all did the cases separately. We know that they were built differently because Renatus Harris, as he became, René Harrison, actually had a lawsuit with somebody who supplied a case that was not the right size and not the right quantity. So we know that it was, they, they was these were provided other, otherwise. But Snetzer had two advantages. First of all, he had a decent workshop set up. And secondly, he had a major advantage in the fact that his younger brother came over, presumably not too long after him, Leonard Snetzler settled in Oxford and became carver to the nobility and carver to the University of Oxford. And if any of you know St John's College Chapel intimately, ah, that's the other Marian Chapel, like Trinity. Uh, I was thinking of that this morning. If you look at the lectern there at St John's, that is carved by Leonard Snetzler and it's an absolutely remarkable piece of work. It's an eagle, of course which now carries a Bible, not like the medieval eagles which carried the Gospel book. But trailing over its head and through its beak and almost down to its toes, uh, beyond its toes, in fact it's almost down to the toes of people standing next to it, is this extraordinary carved garland of flowers. It's absolute tour de force of virtuoso carving, almost on a par, if not on a par, with Grinling Gibbons. So it shows that he was a remarkable character and carver. And it, it's pretty certain that at least as far as the ornaments of the case were concerned, that Leonard Snetzler would have carved those. 
But the question was posed to me this morning, who designed his cases? Well, English case design is, has been extraordinarily conservative. There is in Sambriot Cathedral in Brittany, a case almost certainly made for Westminster Abbey, uh, though we're not quite sure where in Westminster Abbey. It could have been in the Henry VIII or Lady Chapel, or it could have been on the Pulpiton, that was made in 1540, that is roughly 26 feet wide, 26 feet tall, and about four feet deep. And it is absolutely overall carved with Renaissance ornament and twice dated 1540. In, in other words, it was built for Westminster when it was in the interim period between being an abbey and a cathedral. Now that case exhibits, in fact, all the characteristics of all the English cases right down to well into the 19th century. It has the same form, or at least it has three versions of forms of towers of the cases, that is the outside cornices, which are very often round, but sometimes pointed or sometimes multi-agonal. Sometimes uh, you have seven pipes in them, sometimes nine, sometimes five, sometimes three, all depending on the ratio and uh, proportions of the organ to the case. But that casework, as an idea, as a sort of cornice casework derived presumably from Renaissance and Roman models where the sun hits a cornice and, and leaves it in shadow in antique Roman buildings became a model, for, as I say, from 1540 through, well, you can almost say to 1840 when Gothic uh, retook over and almost destroyed cases, in fact, for various reasons. Now, Setzer then would have been able to have a language of cases which he would have been able to draw on. Wide ones, narrow ones, tall ones, small ones. Not only that, Snetzler, by the 1760s, certainly, if not slightly earlier, if not by the time of the King's Lynn organ in the middle of the 1750s, had a repertory of four scale, differently scaled organs. Uh, scaling, when you talk about organs, technically means the actual diameter of a pipe of a given length. So say a four foot long speaking pipe might have a scale of three and a half inches. It might be three and three quarters if it was big, three and a quarter if it's small, three inches if it was very small. Four different scales. And this worked right through the organ from the biggest pipe right to the smallest. Working on a purely linear system, quite simple. On a two to one graph, it's very simple to set out with one or two minor complications, but nothing nothing really difficult to, to understand if you see it actually set out. Using those four scales, Snetzler was able to produce then something like 60 or 70 organs for churches ranging from Beverly Minster, his biggest organ, and that's a big building, right down, if you like, to Peterhouse Chapel. Beverly Minster, though I'm not too sure of the exact scaling of all the pipework there because it's a bit of a muddle, uh, almost certainly was the largest scale organ. His organ at St Mary's Nottingham, which is a double cased, in other words, a case facing both east and west organ when it was first built, is definitely the biggest scale because its pipes survive in St Andrew's Church, unused in that town. So Peterhouse was then the next size down, the small, what I would call the smaller church organ scale. And that scale then refers to the size of case, the height of the case, the depth of the case, and all the pipes that were in it. In other words, it was scaled in visual terms to the building and scaled in acoustic terms to the building as well. That's what every organ builder sets out to do, unless encouraged by a client who wants more stops than the organ builder thinks is fit or wants fewer. But Snetzler would have been working in a tradition where the right sort of numbers of stops and the right choice of stops would have been fairly well established. For him, the important thing was how efficiently to build it. And he definitely did build organs efficiently, almost certainly with an entirely immigrant workforce. There's a very strange inscription, in fact, on the bellows of the organ that was built for Sir Williams Watkins Wynne at Wednesday, that's now in the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff, with a fabulous but rather, <laughs> rather impractical case by Adam. Uh, uh, which uh, would have been a bit of an organ builder's nightmare, I would imagine. And in the bellows of that are inscribed two names from a place which is clearly German, 
I mean, it sounds like it. I can't honestly remember what the place was now because it'll be in the next book and it wasn't in the first. But no one's yet been able to identify where that place was. It's possibly, of course, in, in Poland or part, part of that uh, rather unstable frontier between Poland and Germany, which has had different names at different times. But clearly those two people who built those bellows or at least worked on them were German. And since we know of almost nobody associated with Snetzer that didn't have either a Germanic name or had very strong Germanic connections, that it's pretty certain that everybody was Germanic. Bernie later on, in fact, in Reese's Cyclopedia, I think it was, uh, referred to the industrious Swiss mechanics. He may have been referring to Snetzer's Swiss workshop. I mean, Snetzer was Swiss German, of course. And they were clearly noted for their industriousness, their thoroughness, and their mechanical dexterity, because there's no doubt that Snetzer's organs were built to the very highest standards, to the sort of standard of finish on every component inside, as well as clearly outside, things like the stops, the keyboards and the case, that you would expect to find in a first-class harpsichord. Indeed, uh, an organ I restored at Newby Hall in North Yorkshire was built in 1777 by a harpsichord maker, Thomas Haxby, and of York, and we know that he knew Snetzer and got quite a lot of his technical information from him. And the standard of workmanship in that is just as e is equal to that of Snetzer's, very, very high indeed. So that possibly means that uh, Snetzler was able to have a Germanic, a German-speaking workforce which he could really supervise down to the last degree. These four different designs meant that his design and work, workshop uh, procedures could be heavily streamlined. He therefore was able to drop his prices. And Snetzer became no doubt a sort of bête noir among the English indigenous organ builders at the time, because it's perfectly clear that he was producing organs at considerably under the price of English organs. Well, if the English organs were made in slightly better way than they had been in the 17th century, but not a lot, in other words, partly on the spot, partly in the workshop, partly subcontracted, and then brought together. You can imagine there's a lot of additional costs involved over and above making the entire instrument in the workshop, finishing it in the workshop, well, almost, and making sure it worked and getting people along to say, okay, take it to site, than uh, the, the, the other rather more doubtful system, which had been the typical English one. After Stetzner, it's quite clear that the English did hook onto this system, that they did set out workshops. His own workshops were in fact taken over eventually by a family fr from a tiny village in Gloucestershire called Bevington. And they lasted from the 1790s right through to the 1950s, well, in a sense, anyway. And uh, they certainly systematised organs because in that period they produced 2,000 organs, as opposed to Snetzer's 105. And it's quite clear that even his other contemporaries, the England family, for instance, also systematised uh, organs in a, in a very tight sort of way. They produced a lot of instruments using a pool of workers in possibly more than one workshop, but at least in a systematised way. And so Snetzler's, if you like, legacy to English organ building was this systematisation, this efficiency, and this idea that you could complete an organ and then take it to site, which by the 1770s and 1780s was in fact the normal arrangement anyway for the smaller organs, of which there were very many put into houses. An organ would be taken to a house and it would be pretty well finished the next day. When an organ's finished on the spot though, there is actually quite a lot of work to do. Uh, Snetzer wrote, I've forgotten to whom, to uh, from, from Nottingham, where he was setting up the big instrument in St Mary's, he said, he said, this great instrument tacks up a great deal, of, great deal of my time. His English is almost as bad as my written French, obviously. And the, because at the last minute, on the spot, you would have to do the final voicing, that is, align the pipework, the principles in the first place, to the side of the building, so they resonate correctly in the building. Then, once you've got that right, cut the pipes shorter to their correct pitch and tune them, because pipes were in those days cut 
dead, pretty well dead to length with a slight coning in at the top with a brass instrument, a brass cone, and tuned, and the other ranks would have been regulated in their various ways around the principle. The reed stops themselves require quite a lot of work to finish as well because you have to cut down not only the top, you have to make changes possibly to the curvature of the reeds and so on. So it's quite a long process. But all the physical work is done before you get to the site, including one very interesting point. If you know anything about organ pipes, and I'm sorry I haven't brought a picture, I should have done perhaps. Inside an organ pipe, And here's a Snetzler pipe I had on me. <laughs> it's not out of your organ, I assure you. There is a piece of metal that's actually soldered to the top of this co the cone which forms the foot. It's quite a thick bit of metal. It's about uh, a quarter of the thickness of the... Its thickness is about a quarter of the height of the mouth itself. And that's cut at an angle and soldered into the pipe. In that piece here, on the angle, are what are called nicks. That is, with a sharp-edged instrument, you put some dents into it. Dents being teeth, of course, in the language, which is a sort of tongue. Organ pipes are very <coughs> human. They have feet, tips, bodies, top lip, bottom lip, and tongue. And some even have ears soldered to them, the bigger ones. If you look at the front pipes here in the chapel, you'll see they have ears too. Now this is a Snetzler pipe of the 1750s, I would guess. I got it out of an organ in the north of England. Heaven only knows how it got into that organ, but there were seven of them just sitting in a rank of pipes, of completely other pipes, in fact, of pipes mostly of the 1820s, in fact. This was part of a mixture rank. In other words, it was one rank out of three or four, possibly, that sounded all the same. Those nicks in what we call the languid, have given rise to a lot of controversy and a lot of interest because in the larger pipes, there is actually a nick so far into the edge there that it's jolly difficult to see how it actually could have been made. And various people have said, well, he was right-handed and nicked like that, or he might have been left-handed and nicked like that, or he might have do what I do, which is hold it like this and nick like that. But none of those account for that particular nick. And my co German colleague, who I worked with in, this, in the 80s, he said once they were restoring an organ in Germany of the 17th century, they took the pipe out and it rattled. There was something in the foot of the pipe and it rattled around. They thought, oh, well, so they took, carefully took it apart. And there was a languid, had fallen into the foot. And the nicking was already in the languid. So don't believe any organ builder that tells you that nicking was a romantic process. It was there in organs probably from the very start because it's one of the essential tools of controlling the, the sound of a pipe. Now, contemporaries of Snetzler said that his organs were charming. Now, that's an interesting word. And it's not a word you'd say about many organs built since the 1760s. And it, it's interesting from the point of view that part of the charm comes from regulating the sound of the pipe pretty radically by doing that nicking and doing quite a lot of it and quite finely. Though we do know from Snetzer's other pipes that he actually regulated the amount of nicking dis depending on the diameter of the pipe. In other words, again, he could have pre-nicked that part before the pipe was assembled. And that would have saved an enormous amount of time in the workshop. And it's possibly only one of several techniques he could have used or brought with him from his training in southern Germany, stroke Switzerland, uh, to make the pr production of pipes more rapid. It's possible that that pipe was actually made by Snetzer himself, because we do know that he made his own metal pipes for his early organs. And I would date that, as I say, around 1740, 70, sorry, 55 or 54, somewhere around that, for various reasons. <coughs> when I mentioned when you come to tune an organ, you actually have to make it shorter, uh, this one was made an awful lot shorter. In fact, it was made that much shorter. <laughs> 
than it even is now. To give its correct pitch, you've actually got to put even another tuning on. Tu this is a modern tuning slide. Organs didn't have those until early 20th century, though they're quite useful since. It would have given this pitch, roughly. Cut a pipe shorter, it changes pitch, of course. If you cut it radically shorter, it actually not only changes pitch, it starts to change timbre. The sound of it starts to change quite radically as well. And that's actually important to the history of the organ here in Peterhouse, because certainly by the 1890s, when the organ was rebuilt, the pitch of the organ was raised quite considerably. The pitch of the organ in the first place would have been the pitch, the English concert pitch, which was fixed in 1711 by the invention, uniquely in England, of the tuning fork, invented by John Shaw, the trumpeter friend of Purcell, who is celebrated in Sound the Trumpet, and Let the Listening Shores Rebound, you will remember is part of the Dryden's text for that. And that pitch went right through from 1711 to, 18, to the 1840s, when German bands came in and started playing at higher pitches and every, all hell broke loose and ever since then organ pitches has been fairly uncertain, shall we say, or at least always fairly debatable. Anyway, I had to put two tuning slides on this to get to the right length. When I found it, this pipe sounded like this. I don't know if you remember the sound of it before. That has a modicum of harmonics in it, quite a lot. Not too many because it's a mixture pipe. It, didn't, it speaks not on its own, it speaks with other pipes, so it has to be fairly moderate in sound. But you can quite clearly hear it has lost its harmonics when you got up to that higher pitch. It's lost its focus of tone. And that is the history of Snetzel's organs, because he built them at 425, and apart from one or two organs that have been restored, like your uh, nearest Snetzel organ in anything like original condition, in fact, in pretty good original condition now, at Clare College, all the or which is now back to 425, and sounds all the, much, all the better for it, of course, all the organs of Snetzler's have been raised in pitch. So they sound, well, less focused, probably louder, because one of the things an organ builder does when, when they discover that, oh dear, this has gone all fluty, they blur it a bit harder to make it less fluty again. So the organs not only go higher in pitch, they get louder. And I would say less charming. I'm a professional singer, or have been all my life, since the age of nine. Um, and singers are the last people ever to be asked their opinion about organs. I'm sure your new director of music will change things. But uh, certainly to sing to an organ that is not too loud and is charming is, of course, a lot better for singers. Because first of all, they can hear themselves think. Secondly, they can hear themselves sing. And most importantly, they can hear everyone else singing as well. Because the only way to sing in a chorus is, to, is the golden rule that if you're singing too, if you can't hear anyone else, you're singing too loudly. So we hope that here we can have a Snetzer organ one day that is back to the scale of the, of the chapel, that is back to the scale of the pipework that Snetzer put in it. And I've given you in the, in the handouts uh, the results of a fair, reasonably long investigation inside the organ last December, which has, I did largely in order to provide material for the book, um, but also so you have some idea of, of what was in that organ, because the uh, various accounts of it aren't wholly clear. It was a long step, you see, from 1765 to 1894, when it was radically altered, and we don't know a lot about what happened in the meanwhile. Uh, then perhaps one day you can have an organ that's scaled to the chapel, as I say. A question that occurred to me actually just this morning, did Snetzler put his organ on a gallery? It was there before. Well, clearly he did put it on a gallery and it was obviously there before the organ, but it, was that there only half an hour before or was it there a long time before? 
did he scale the organ knowing the height of the gallery and the height of the roof, as one would do if one was designing an organ case, and a, indeed a gallery to go with it? I think these are questions that perhaps just do need to go into, be gone into. And someone raised also the question of doing a proper structural survey of the gallery and the antechapel in general. And that would be naturally a very good thing. And if it turned out that the Snetzer organ, whose height we know, whose depth we know, it was actually 82 inches deep. Most of you know what 82 inches are, I think. Those of you who don't, it's 2 metres 10. Which is that much. That's its original depth. Can I show, if I put that on there? <laughs> That's all. If you go up in the organ loft now, you'll see an organ that is at least three times the depth, has pipework behind it, above it, and beside it. In other words, the usual inflation <laughs> has taken place. So if you want to go back to a Snetzer organ, you'll have a charming instrument, scaled to the chapel. And I wish you well with your deliberations in finding. And I firmly hope that in my lifetime, I will hear a larger Snetzer organ than anything I've been able to restore so far in its original sound and wonderfully here, of course, in its original acoustic. That would be such a joy. And imagine what we could learn about the music of that period if we could actually hear that. It would be, for me, Seventh Heaven anyway. And I hope for you too, you would be calmed by its, by its sound. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions before we break for tea? Oh, if we're going to record this, if I don't, if you don't mind. The reason for the for the speaker is not that we can't hear you, but it just helps with the recording. This is really a very minor footnote to the. Um, the question of where the organ originally lay in the chapel in the 17th century. Um, there are references in the accounts to an organ vestry. Um, and presumably the only place that could have been um, is in the north gallery, um, i.e. that part of the set of galleries that does not form part of the master's lodge, as the south gallery does. Um, given that the logical place for the glazed closet would be on axis with um, the west window, um, there's nothing in the accounts to suggest that it's at the southwest, uh, southeast uh, corner. Uh, we just know there was a closet, um, and that presumably was centrally placed following royal patterns. That's not 100% uh, logical because we know that um, the Holy Day closet at Hampton Court, for instance, uh, was. Uh, divided in two. So there was a, a royal closet that was on the south side. Um, but assuming that it was on axis, um, that really leaves only uh, the north side of the chapel as the place where, as you suggested, um, it would be likely that uh, this organ loft, which again is referred to, as you say, in the accounts, would be situated, and that would have access to it from the north gallery. Uh, so I just throw that as a, po as a possible hypothesis. Thank you. Yes, that's very helpful. Well, part of the problem is not knowing how large the loft was needed to be to accommodate the organ, but the relationship of that to the royal closet is, is clearly critical. So thank you for that. Any other remarks or questions? Well... May I thank our speakers once again? And uh, they'll be around for tea to, ask, to answer questions if you think of anything pressing. Thank you. <laughs>